Good morning and welcome to Dunlow Baptist Church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning around your word. Thank you that your word is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. Help us, Lord, to see the light and to walk in the light and to rejoice in it. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I want to read this morning from John's Gospel, chapter 12, and verse 12 to 26. Fairly short reading. John 12, verse 12. The next day a large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus, having found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been done. That had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went out to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. These came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. But Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the time and opportunity to consider your word together. Thank you for the promise of your Holy Spirit to take your word and make application of your word to our hearts according as we have need. Lord, you know each one of us, where we are physically and where we are spiritually. You know whether we are cold towards you, dull in our spiritual life, or whether we are really close to you and on fire for Christ. But Lord, wherever it is we are, pray that you will meet us in that place and lead us on, that we may grow closer to you, that we may become more like you, that we may understand better and rejoice more fully in God our Saviour. Lord, speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Those of you who are in the happy position of having a church calendar, Dunmo Baptist Church calendar, may have noticed that this week, according to the calendar, is our harvest Thanksgiving. Clearly the shared lunch and the 
big push to get people to come in and the pile of food and stuff for the uh, food bank, that isn't going to happen in the usual way this year. But that doesn't stop us looking at the harvest. Because very fortuitously, just continuing our studies in John's Gospel, just moving through without pushing it at all, in God's providence we come to our text today in John chapter 12, verse 23-24. When Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, Truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Despite COVID-19 and all the lockdown and everything else, the miracle of harvest is continuing. Stuff is being brought in from the fields every day. Single seeds have grown into multitudes of seeds. Abundant crops have been harvested and are being harvested. And we have to give praise to God for it. We are totally dependent on God for that. Just imagine if this Covid thing, instead of giving us flu-like symptoms, gave all growing plants death-like symptoms, and nothing grew. That would be a plague of far greater proportions. That would be a pandemic which would wipe us off the face of the earth. If nothing grows, we have no food. So we are deeply indebted to the Lord God that, once again, this miracle has happened. Harvest has occurred. So totally dependent on it, but it's amazing how little notice most people take of it. And the reason why people take so little notice of it is, of course, because God is so faithful. You buy a packet of seeds, you scatter them on the ground, and they grow. And if they don't grow, you complain. Because Generally speaking, they do. God is faithful. And we know it's God's work, not ours. Remember, Jesus took five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000 people. And another quantity, four loaves, what it in space, fed 4,000 people. How did he do that? The power of God, multiplying food. One grain equals thousands. One loaf equals food for thousands. God doing this miracle over and over. But because it always happens, like the sun always rises and always sets, we tend to forget. God promised seed time and harvest, summer and winter, day and night, cold and heat, shall not cease while the earth remains. That was the promise to Noah after he came out of the ark after the flood. And God's kept that promise. And because God is faithful, we tend to forget. Harvest is, as many areas of the world know only too well, very, very dependent upon God's blessing. You need good soil. You need good weather. You need undisturbed growth. Deserts don't grow harvests. War zones don't grow harvest. War and famine go together. Drought and famine go together. There's been pests of all sorts causing major problems in Ethiopia and Pakistan and other places in Africa. Tremendous problems. So we here in the United Kingdom, we really should praise and thank God our harvest has happened. It's an abundant harvest. And because of our prosperity, we have the privilege, and it is a privilege, of being able to send food aid to those in need. Praise the Lord. And may God help us to be truly grateful and truly generous in supporting those who are helping the hungry. But moving on from there, 
Harvest is a, a picture, a parable, of something that is of far greater glory to God than a field of ripe corn. Harvest is a picture of God's church, gathered, complete, finished, perfect, into his eternal kingdom. We find this picture over and over in the New Testament uh, and in Jesus' teaching. For instance, in John chapter 4. John chapter 4, you remember the story, Jesus had gone into Samaria and he'd sat down by the well at Sychar. And a Samaritan woman had come and she talked to Jesus and in talking to Jesus she seen that Jesus was indeed Messiah. And she'd gone back into the town, told everyone about Jesus, and they were all coming out of the town to meet Jesus. He was still sitting by the well at Sychar. John 4.35, Jesus says to the disciples, Do you not say there is yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes. See, the fields are white for harvest. Jesus saw hundreds of people coming out of the town to him. Harvest. Matthew 9, verses 36 to 38. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. The harvest, the church. The church is all the fruit of one seed. The whole church, worldwide, every individual Christian throughout the world, in this generation and in all previous and future generations, millions, billions, all the product of one seed. And that one seed is Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So let's consider the subject. I don't think I mentioned it before, but here it is. The subject is through death to glory. And the text, verse 23, 24, Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And I want to look at the workers, the miracle and the glory. The workers, the miracle and the glory. The workers. Now, in context of Matthew 9, 36 to 38, when Jesus saw the crowds and had compassion on them, they were like sheep without a shepherd. Harvest is plentiful, the labourers are few, therefore pray earnestly the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. In that context, the workers who harvest the fields are evangelists. Jesus is basically saying, look around, you've got thousands of neighbours. Every one of them is a potential candidate for the kingdom of heaven. You haven't got enough time to speak to every one of them. Pray that the Lord would bring more people into the work of talking about Jesus, of preaching the gospel. But in the context of our text, the workers have a far less joyful job to be doing than gathering in the harvest. They have the necessary but not happy job of planting the seed. Psalm 126 verses 5 to 6, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping bearing the seed for sowing shall come home with shouts of joy bringing seed uh, sheaves with him. Seed corn, good, healthy grain. It's got to be good, healthy grain. It's got to be stuff that would have made a really good loaf of bread. 
stuff that would have been really tasty. And if times are hard, you sometimes have to go hungry in order to be able to plant seeds. And we are looking at this as a parable. A parable of Jesus. He is the most perfect man ever. The perfect seed. And there were three types of workers who were in the business of planting him. First, and in context most obvious, are Jesus' enemies, who just can't wait to see him safely underground. They have no hope of a crop. Their idea of glory is to just get rid of Jesus. Get him out of their lives. As Philippians 3 verse 19 says, they glory in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. That's the way of the world. Get God out. Live the life your way. Do what you want to do. Keep God out of it. That's the glorious way for them. Their mind is set on earthly things. They've got no thought of eternity. Yet even in their hatred of God, even doing their worst, they are nonetheless doing their part in God's plan. They bury the seed, literally. Then there's the disciples. They had many bitter tears as they watched as Jesus' enemies carried out their purposes. With Jesus into that tomb went all their hopes for the future. They saw there the best, the only, the perfect Lord, Master, Saviour, Messiah, Son of God. Everything their heart desired, they saw him buried. So the enemies provided the work, as it were. The disciples provided the tears. But above it all, there is God. Jesus gave himself. John chapter 10. I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. And I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. God the Father commanded God the Son. God the Son did it according to his own will. God was united in the business of planting this seed. Now is the Son of Man to be glorified. How? By being buried, dying on a cross. This is the glory of God. This is, verse 23, the hour when the Son of God, the Son of Man, shall be glorified. In Daniel chapter 7, <coughs> excuse me, Daniel chapter 7, verses 11 to 14, we read, Daniel says, I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, sorry, let me read that again. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season at a time. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be 
destroyed. Daniel's prophecy, four, five, maybe 600 years earlier, maybe a bit more than that, foreseeing the Son of Man coming into the presence of God, victorious, risen from the grave, having killed the beast and severely taken away the dominion of the other beasts. It's prophecy and that's another sermon to delve into it. But the Son of Man's triumph over the devil, over sin, over death, it began with his death, the corn seed, dying, buried. Well, there's a lot more why maybe we could say about that, but let's move on to the miracle second point. You know, it is a miracle. Anything else that you bury rots away eventually. That's why we have landfill sites. Get rid of stuff. Bury it. It will rot. But not seeds. Bury a seed, even in the conditions that will send tin cans rusty or rot away things, and it will grow. That's a miracle. It's a miracle that we're used to. But leaving that aside in the context, the miracle is what Jesus accomplished by his death. This glory of God is already foreshadowed in the raising of Lazarus. How could Jesus have the authority to bring back to life people who had died? Death is the wages of sin. How could it possibly be that sin would not get its wages? Christ died for our sins. He pays the penalty. What Jesus accomplished in his death is seen in the fullness of the church. Millions and millions of millions of people who are the fruit of the sacrifice of Christ. The fruit of this one seed that was buried. What Jesus achieved when he laid down his life. And, you know, you plant a wheat seed, what grows? Wheat. You plant a son of God, what grows? children of God. John chapter 1 verse 12. All who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The church, God's children, millions of them. It's a picture, it's a parable, can't push it too far. It becomes silly if you do. But think about it. Everything appeared to be a disaster. The only sinless man that has ever been born. The only sinless man that has ever lived. The perfect example of humanity. Dead. Buried. Surely that's an end of all hope. Surely that's a triumph for the devil and all his agents. No. It's the glory of God. It's a complete defeat of the devil and all his agents. Look at Paul in Galatians 6 verse 14. Far be it from me to boast in anything except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Or the older version, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Christ Jesus my Lord. Christianity is based on a miracle, a work that only God can do. Jesus, dead, because of our sin, as a sacrifice, thereby giving life to millions. That's the glory, third point. The glory of God. 
Jesus told his disciples in John 15, 8, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. The more fruit there is, the more glory goes to God. Jesus produces all the fruit to the glory of God. Everyone for whom Christ died will be there in the kingdom. You will not lose any of them. Totally glorifying God. Perfect sacrifice, perfect result. God's kingdom complete. Much fruit. God's glory fully manifest. But there was no other way to do it than by death. Verse 25, 26. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, him the Father will honour. That doesn't mean we all have to be martyrs. It doesn't mean we're all going to suffer an untimely fate. It means God first. Loving God more than your life. Loving to serve God more than serving yourself. And if that means death, well, so be it. It's an interesting fact of history. You can see it all the way through history. If the devil stirs up persecution so that a lot of God's children die as martyrs, there is always a revival in the church. Wherever there has been heavy persecution, wherever there is heavy persecution, the church grows faster. And verse 26, if anyone loves me, if anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. You're faithful to death, God honours you by using your death to save others. If we're faithful in whatever it is we do, God honours us by using whatever we do to save others, to build others up in their holy faith. We have the wonderful situation that even though we may not plant death, as it were, whatever we give, God honours us by using it for the blessing of others, to the glory of his name. So Jesus, our text, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Put that into context. What could he be talking about? He had just ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey with everybody shouting and praising God and hailing him as king. That meant nothing. That wasn't glorifying the Son of God. What glorified the Son of God was betrayal, torture, death, burial. Why is that so? Because thereby he saved his people. Riding into Jerusalem saved nobody. Crowds of people shouting and screaming saved nobody. Christ crucified saves everybody who trusts in him. In Luke 6, 22, 23 and 26, Jesus said, Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn you as your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the, to the prophets. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Through death, glory. Through sacrifice, praise. This is the way of the world. We live in a world which is sinful. We live in a world which is under the dominion of evil. 
The devil's workers are seeking to destroy Christ, seeking to destroy the church. But as they destroyed Christ, they thought, they brought glory to God by millions being saved. Every sinner who has ever been saved was saved because Christ died. And as we suffer, grief, great grief maybe, it all works together for good. Romans 8, 28, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Everything through suffering comes glory. Through being buried, whatever that means, in our personal lives, comes glory to God. Sinners saved. Sinners growing, sorry, saved people growing in their faith. God is glorified as the church grows. And we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom. So, harvest, we depend on it. We depend on the miracle of God making seed grow for our life. And we depend on the miracle of Christ dying for our sins, for our eternal. Praise the Lord. Mighty God and loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that he gave his life and through his death we are saved. Thank you, Lord, that you are glorified in the saving of sinners. Lord, why you should set your love upon us, why you should care, why your grace should be poured out upon us, we cannot tell, but we know it is true. And we thank you, O oh Lord God our Father, that it was you who made the saving of sinners your glory, and that you have fully accomplished your glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to understand these things. In his name. Amen.